Today is really exciting for me. I started about a year ago talking with John McGill about taking over the supplying of the MDF Rose engine lathe, and I am so glad he was gracious enough to agree. John also put me in contact with a guy named Jack Zimmel, who is now partnered with me in this endeavor. Jack and I took this chance to make a few changes to the MDF Rose engine lathe from the original designs, and we're calling this the MDF Rose engine lathe 2.0. One option we are going to provide is to get all the MDF parts as a pre-cut kit. Jack took my drawings and design ideas and worked with a local cabinet shop to develop a kit and a way to ship that kit in a flat pack like you get from Ikea. This box right here contains the second prototype of that MDF Rose Engine Lathe 2.0 and I'm pretty sure it's ready to go. So let's pop the top and see what we have. Well, I took all the screws out, removed the top, and here's what we got. It's uh, really nicely done. You can see here all the parts are laid out in here for you, and well, for me actually right now. And I need to now unbox everything and lay it out, and then I'm going to go ahead and get started. So hang on for a little while while I do that. So I got all the MDF parts out, and what remains here is the set of all the other parts you need to make this machine at least for the base and the headstock. It doesn't include the controls and uh, a few other pieces but what's really cool is they come in baggies here and so you uh, will take the bags of all the set parts and put them together and the instructions that we're going to provide will give you instructions on how to do that. Thanks. I've laid out most of the pieces here on the bench and I'm ready to get started. When, my, when I built my original MDF Rose engine, I painted it Powermatic Yellow. It looks good, but for a number of reasons I'm going to stay with the MDF look on this one. I'm going to finish all the pieces with shellac to reduce wood movement problems, and experience has shown that it's easier to do that before they are assembled. I'll do that off screen and then come back when I'm ready to go to the next step. But I do want to show you one piece before I stop. So, right here, you can see Jack has done a great job where it says H4L. That is the part number that you're going to see in all of the manuals. So when we talk about putting the part numbers together, we're going to tell you what part number to use. And they're already come pre-labeled as well. So great job, Jack. Thanks. I finished assembling my MDF Rose Engine Lathe 2.0, and you can see it here on the left. I have it sitting right beside my original MDF Rose Engine Lathe there on the right. And of course you can see the Powermatic yellow color that I applied to it. But you also can see the difference in size. The bed's much bigger. And the bed on the right was bigger than the original design. That one's 18 inches by 18. Where the one on the left has a 24 inches square. So I'm going to go into a few more of the other features in the 2.0 design. But I wanted you to see the ability to, to compare these two between the original one and the new one. So let's start with the headstock. The headstock is an inch taller than it was before, and it's mounted an inch higher in the bed. What this gives us is just short of eight inches here in terms of clearance above the bed, which is really nice. You may also notice that I'm putting this inside the spindle, which has a Morse taper built in, and I'll show you some more about that in a second. It also comes with this really neat logo that we uh, cut into the, the wood if you buy the kit from us. Certainly you can do it on your own with the 2.0 design. We retain the fading wedge. The kit we're providing, we're making that of a plastic rather than wood just because it's easier, but certainly you can still make that of MDF. The rest of the headstock remains the same as what John had designed with uh, the same distance side to side and the same distance front to back or front to back. But one of the things that we did is that we added T-tracks to the top and to the back. So give me a second to adjust the camera and I'll show you those. The T-tracks are Two are on top here and two are on the back side here. And the specification that we've published has them a exact distance from the center of the spindle. And they're three inches center to center here, three inches center to center here, and they're centered one and a half inches above and one and a half inches left and right. So what that's going to do is we're going to have some add-ons coming later that will be built on using these T-tracks. They're flush, of course, with the surface here because it makes it look nicer if nothing else. But you're going to see more to come, and if you do build your own, I would encourage you to add those because you're going to want to use them later. The original design that came from John had a spindle with a head that was one inch eight uh, threaded, 
And what we've decided to do is to go with a Morse taper. And this is a number two Morse taper so that you can put your uh, chucks into an adapter and then move them from your other lathe to this lathe. And in my testing, I've seen almost zero run out. And what that looks like is this. And you can see that this would be inserted into the Morse taper here. And then, of course, there's a drawbar to uh, hold it tight. The next big change in the 2.0 machine is on this side. And this is what was the B3 piece in the original design. So let's talk about these changes. First one is that we added this back column for our rubber support. And this is requested by a lot of artists because they wanted to use the rubber on the back side rather than moving the cutter to the back side. It achieves the same purpose in terms of cutting from the opposite side of the rosette. But many artists said that this actually makes it a lot nicer. So this was added. Uh, it just comes there and you can use it when you're ready to do so. The second one is that we mounted the rubber column here and there's more distance between the rubber and this column. And this is so that there's room for an amplitude adjuster, which is something that is, is certainly a device that you're going to want to use at some point in your career with an ornamental turning. To do that, we had to mount a piece here that enabled the rubber to be closer. And what a design that came from a fellow out in Oregon is to be able to move this up or down and we can loosen these four screws and move the whole thing up or down and then it's easy enough to once it's locked in place at whatever amplitude you want then you can move the rubber in, uh, in or out and this is just the standard rubber that comes with it but certainly it's on a t-track so any rubber could be used and the, the next thing that had to be done was because this front column was actually mounted to the bottom piece now it's a part of that same piece so that it gives the room for putting this piece to go up and down on. This is an early prototype machine so that's why you see the cutout here. That was the original cutout that was required for the stepper motor which you see here and this by the way is a standard design on this machine but the uh, current plans don't have this cutout because it's not necessary any longer and it's not necessary because we raised the support points here up an inch as well as the entire um, it's longer by another inch so the clearance here is not is sufficient that you don't need to have this cut out for this bracket and this bracket of course holds the stepper motor behind here and that drives the pulley which um, makes this run very well the hand nut here is used on the threaded rod that is a part of the adapter and that's what's used through the bar to make sure that it stays in place and uh, this just is easier to get on and off with uh, rubber grips and it's easy to grip I can tell you uh, to use it on and off and you know I've even used this on the Powermatic lathe that more than a thousand rpm and it worked fine so uh, you but you could certainly use uh, a nut that um, it's a 3 8 16 is the thread on the draw bar, so you could use whatever you want. But this works well, and this is what we're going to ship when you buy the kit from us. So there are three things that I want to point out on the back side of the lathe. Let's go through them uh, from left to right. This hole was put in by Jack, and what it allows you to do is to reach inside the carcass to get to the pivot point for the headstock, and that's useful if you have to, to transport your machine to be able to quickly get into there to loosen that pivot point and then take the headstock out. That's, it's so easy to reach on the right side but you needed to get to the left side. This opening here was put into place so that you can vacuum out the dust that would fall into the area right here and you can see it's open now all the way to that area. What you don't see though is that we put a hole in the bottom of the headstock and it's now open all the way into that area and you can see Yes, you can see there. It's, what that does is it lets dust fall all the way through and then periodically you can vacuum it out with your shop vac. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to do. And that way the maintenance on this machine is going to be a lot easier. The other piece is that this hole here is used for the wires that connect to the stepper motor and there's a, a pier hole you know, into the headstock on the other side which lets you go straight through and connect the wires there. So let me show you then where those go. This entire system is based around the idea of using a microcontroller for a stepper motor design. 
And that microcontroller is inside this box. This is the design that we've come up with. And you can do yours your, differently if you'd like, or you can buy this completed box. We designed this box with two things in mind. One is that it fits into the bed, underneath the bed, right behind here. And I can show you mine. And the other is that you could actually use this on the other lathes. You could put this onto the original Rose Engine lathe. Just There's not room to set it under the bed, but you could set it to the side. That's fine. So it drives four different steppers, the spindle, X, Z, and Bravo axis. The B is used for spherical slides. And then we have limiter home switches. Uh, the home buttons aren't yet quite activated, but the limits are. And I'm going to show you those in a second and how those work. And then, of course, it has a touchscreen display that you can see here. And this just makes for an awesome setup. And here's the other point that I hope that you take away from this. You may build this today, and all you're going to use is the spindle. We're going to be coming up with add-ons throughout 2021 and beyond that will use these other pieces, and all you're going to have to do is just plug them in and go. So let me show you some examples of uh, a prototype that we're looking at right now. It's not certainly ready for prime time. It's really rough looking, but it will show you how this works. This shows you the controls box in place under the 2.0 machine, and you can see it fits very nicely under the bed. The other thing of note here is two. One, the connectors for all the stepper motors are using standard GT16-4 connectors, which are freely available anywhere from Amazon or a lot of other places. And all of the limit switches are using the eighth inch or three and a half millimeter uh, phono jacks that you can use either mono or stereo. It really only needs mono because all you're doing is when you uh, short the two wires, it immediately does the uh, limit function. So I'm going to show you this in operation and you'll be able to see how greatly this works. So when we talk about the stepper controls, we use this touch screen and I've gone to the uh, main function. There are a lot of other functions and certainly that can get a little confusing, but the great thing is you don't have to remember this because we put the complete manual for how to use this online along with a lot of other manuals in the MDF library. And I'll put a, um, <clears throat> a link in the notes about this, but all of the books that we have compiled in terms of information, how to use the machine, even how to build it, are all there in the MDF Rose Engine library. Okay, So as you can see, you just say, I want to rotate this in the standard uh, counterclockwise manner, which is forward, as it were. Or I can stop and go in reverse. It's uh, pretty high speed here. We're running about 5.2 RPM. So if we wanted to slow that down, we just take the slider here, and now we're running about 0.5 RPM. And we can even go slower. It's, it's not difficult at all. But as you see, with the stepper motor, the great thing about this is that we can set that speed and we don't lose torque. If you use a traditional motor and you used a variable speed of some form with variable frequency drive, for example, you would lose torque at those very slow speeds. And I have run this at uh, 2 minutes per revolution. Not revolutions per minute, two minutes per revolution. And it worked just fine. So let me set it up and I'm going to show you the spindle running in conjunction with a cross slide. It's very important on machines like this to turn them off when you're connecting and disconnecting motors uh, or steppers of any form. And we actually say just turn it on or off if you're connecting or disconnecting anything. It doesn't take long to start up, but it was nice, and this actually shows you what the startup screen looks like. You can see here it's got a nice picture of the same machine you're running, so in case you forget what it goes to. So let's go into the main slide, and here I'm going to be rotating the spindle, but also I'm going to move this to this direction in the z-axis. So what you'll be able to see is both of these running in synchronization. So I've got the spindle running. Let's speed this up. And there you go. So you can imagine a cutter being attached here to the holder and then it would be cutting along the axis as you're going. So indeed, if this were actually engaged with our rosette, you would see some movement 
back and forth on the headstock at the same time as we progress down. Now these are obviously running much, much faster than you would want to. And that's a key point. It is running very fast, so you couldn't really walk away and go get a cup of coffee or go get your lunch or something like that. So we implemented limit switches. And let me show you what that's like. So I've got a simulation of my limit switch here with the two wires that would be hooked to it. And as soon as I touch these together, everything's going to stop. So let me show you how that works. So I'd be rotating this and I'm moving along the z-axis. And at some point, it's going to get to the end and I'm going to want it to stop. And I want it to stop automatically and not have to ha be here just in case something happens. So I'd put a limited switch in place so that these two wires would touch each other. And as soon as they do, I stop the movement along the z-axis and I stop the spindle and everything doesn't crash. So this is a prototype that we put together. But the great thing is the controls didn't change to use this prototype. And it's not going to change when we do a curvilinear, which is coming in 2021. We're also going to be doing a spherical slide. It'll use the same control system. So you'll be able to, and we're going to publish the plan. So you'll be able to make your own or buy it from us and use the same control system either way. So that's the 2.0 machine. I hope it's something that excites you and you want to go out and use it. And uh, good luck.